This is Lydia Sung with NeoSeeker, and we are at E3 Day 2, and we're here at THQ to check out Darksiders 2. And hi, I'm Jay Fitzloff, associate producer on Darksiders 2 at Vigil Games. And uh, we got to play the game earlier, and we saw a lot of changes between Darksiders 1 and 2 that were, frankly, pretty damn awesome. Uh, so some of those changes that we saw we'd like to highlight are a lot more RPG elements, like uh, skill tier, uh, tiers for the skills mm -hmm. and you know, equipable weapons. Could you talk a little bit about you know, some of these changes that we're seeing that's more lean towards RPG over... Yeah. combining with the action I think you know my my easiest way to explain it is you know in Darksiders 1 when you played war character progression was linear you and I would play we'd begin the same and we'd end basically the same so what we wanted to do was make uh, the experience more personal by having it more uh, you know you're always actively changing your character and customizing it so that's where you see like you said the the skill trees the loot drops the leveling and even um, now you buy in our hub towns the uh, combat maneuvers for sights, heavy weapons, light weapons. And what that does is within an hour or two hours, you and I are already going to have different divergent characters. And by the end of the game, very much so. You know, uh, we have our skill trees, but by design, you can't have all the skills in the game. You have to pick and choose your direction. I think more or less people will go in a direction that fits their play style or kind of their preferences, but also it opens up that possibility of a uh, conversation over, I built my character this way, or have you tried this, or did you ever find this weapon, or try this combination of uh, attack methods? And so it's really uh, makes death a uh, more customizable and exciting character, in my opinion. So there's definitely this uh, greater emphasis on giving players more freedom in how the character progresses, despite the fact that you are playing a pre designed character. Yeah, correct. I mean, it's death and you know you want to be fearsome and you want to and you, you know he's a tough guy but at the same time you know all that progression and we're very careful about balancing we want to make sure there's no um secret combination that breaks the game and um the equipment too we don't have cg cutscenes this time i think you might have noticed that because when you equip something you visually see it on your character and then in the cutscenes you're wearing what you're wearing when you're talking to someone or during an action sequence so again when you build your character you see it in the flesh throughout the game um, another major difference we noticed was also, if anyone's played Darksiders 1, they would know that when you play as War, War's this huge guy, he looks it and he feels it, um, and even though uh, Darksiders 2 is still the same, more or less, vein of action game, it feels like a totally different experience, different character. Can you talk a little bit about how what you guys did to really contrast Death with his younger brother? Yeah, so... You know, when we first we sit down, we say, all right, we're getting to make Darksiders 2. What do we want to do? And we say, it'd be unfair for us to use war again because there's three other horsemen, so let's switch it up. And then, of course, we chose Death because he's obviously the most well-known of all of them. And then we say to ourselves, now, it'd be easy enough just to have uh, the war moves or the war feel with a new skin, but if you're making a new horseman, let's make it completely different. Let's make each horseman feel completely unique from the other one. So, like you said, where war was kind of this unstoppable force this brute just lumbering heavy weapons just smashing his way through a problem death you as you can see he floats around the combat field he's always dodging like war would block death dodges but also death's more agile so you saw him uh, skitter up walls uh, wall run able to climb higher so that in our level design is more vertically inclined because death can get to these places that war couldn't get and then we even do it in personality and his posture the way he stands where War barely talked. He was stoic. And, you know, I, I always joke, I was like, he met four people in Darksiders 1 and killed three of them, right? But Deathel, you know, it ta is a talk and is conniving in a bit, in a way, but will discuss things with people. But that opened up possibility since Death uh, is a conversationalist more than War. We have conversation trees with NPCs throughout the game, and some of those can lead to side quests. If you get in the right conversation mode with somebody, you'll find uh, other adventures that you wouldn't otherwise find. I mean, but that's not to say that... Uh death has to go a certain way. I mean, like you said before, there's definitely the option to let players sort of control how death evolves. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw some of that when you find the different weapons that the enemies will start dropping mm -hmm. now. Like, for example, contrasting the way the size feel versus if you picked up a heavy weapon like a hammer or a super light weapon like the claws. Yeah. I mean, do, will certain enemies and does the gameplay, is the gameplay designed to accommodate certain sets or is it a total freedom to how you want to play, freedom to change your style? 
I mean, yeah, players always have the freedom to change their style or weapons. I mean, obviously based on what they find or what gets dropped. There will be times, though, where, I'll give a real basic example, where say you were in a fire level with fire-based creatures. Obviously, if a weapon had a cold attack, it would do more damage versus that creature type. So there's choices like that to be made. And then also within the weapon itself, it's not as simple as just damage. A uh, quick example I give is you might have one weapon that every time you kill somebody it heals you slightly, but you might have another weapon that every time you uh, hurt somebody it regenerates your wrath, and if you're a spellcaster that's important to you. So the choices in weapons come down to a lot of elements because of the randomly generated statistics. So you know, you might, one person might prefer to be healed even though he's not doing a lot of damage. And somebody else might just say, I like this weapon because it looks cool and, and pure and simple as that. On that, um, on that line of thought, I also noticed that in the very beginning of the game, you're pretty much, you start out with your horse. You have despair with you. Are there other ways in which death starts out feeling a lot more strong than how war started in Darksiders 1? I, I yes, but not, uh, by design, we didn't want death to feel stronger than war. At the end, we want him to feel equally as powerful. But what happened was we realized with the first game, well, A, a lot of people said, you're a horse from the apocalypse from the first game, yet I don't get my horse till halfway through the game. And we're like, yeah, valid point. Okay, fair enough. So literally, you begin on your horse in this game. And we also have a lot more overworld areas to explore. Again, if you go into certain corners, you'll find uh, hidden areas or extra adventures that are off the beaten path. So we wanted you to have that horse to explore those bigger, larger overworld areas uh, without having to walk it. But also, we wanted um, death to feel more fearsome a little bit from the get-go because it is death. You know, he's the most naturally feared of all the horsemen. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And we wanted to uh, get to the core of the game more. In the first game, we felt it felt like just a combat game until about, I don't know, two or three hours in, and then it kind of started hitting its stride. So we give you more pieces of the puzzle right away, so you get a feel for what Darksiders is earlier than having to earn it. On the in, the in terms of pacing, there was a really huge criticism from the first game was towards the end, there was there were a, a few levels, or one level, the tower, yeah. that was all puzzles, and a lot of players like took a hiatus from the game. They, yeah. they sort of took a break, and then they went back. Is is that something that you guys considered in the second game? Maybe uh, uh, broke down the puzzles a little bit, or reduced the number of puzzles that death has to do? Yeah, if we figured, well, so if you break down Darksiders one between uh, combat, traversal, and puzzle solving, and say there's a certain percentage of each of those three. Darksiders 3 is still basically that same breakdown of percentages. However, we're super aware that Darksiders 1, the difficulty scale would go up, but then there'd be these spikes like that. Mm -hmm. So we're very conscious of making sure it's uh, a progression, but without the spikes. So it's consistently moving like that escalation without those super moments of uh, frustration that some people had. And speaking of the tower, we also designed all our dungeons. So there's only backtracking if you want to do it. If there's, you get a new item and you realize, oh, I could get that chest I couldn't reach before now, you're free to do that, but we don't force you within our level design itself. Once you're done with the level, there's an easy exit or there's a quick exit, so there's a lot less backtracking than the uh, first game. Yeah, that, I remember that was kind of an issue for some people who maybe didn't unlock all the serpent holes mm -hmm. the first the first uh, play. Right. So without spoiling too much um, about the ending of Darksiders 1, but in the beginning of Darksiders 2, we did actually hear mention and see silhouettes of the other horsemen that were right. not in the first game. Uh, does that mean that their presence will actually you know, be bigger in the second game, whereas opposed to the first game, it's pretty much just war, 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 up until, you know, the end? Right. I'm... I'm not going to give away if, if that happens or if it doesn't happen, but here's how I'll explain it. You know, the game's storylines do run parallel. At the same time, while war is fighting heaven and hell, death's investigating in the underworld outside those politics how he can uh, exonerate his brother's name. So they're running, you know, they're running parallel, but there are crossover points where characters or story elements or even items or mentions of people come back around. So, but we had to be careful. If you've played Darksiders 1, they're there for you as kind of like that aha moment. They fill in holes in the story. But at the same time, if you haven't, you're not going to be lost. You know, you, you just be like, oh, that's, that's cool. Like, whatever. And I think an example of that you saw in this demo is at the end of this demo, uh, you're going to meet the Crow Father, and he turns into kind of a facsimile of war. Now, for a player, the first one, it's great because you'll say, wow, now I know how to control death, and I can see 
now that I'm fighting war, how different the two characters are because I can see how war is this heavy combatant and what he's doing to me. But if you haven't played Darksiders 1, it's still a cool fight. It doesn't matter that you didn't experience war. It's still cool regardless. So in terms of the characters in this game, are we going to see a lot of returns? Like, for example, Samael was kind of a big thing. I can't say. You know? I can't say. There, I, there are returns, but I can't say specifically. Hand me the mic. Oh. <laughs> Let me, can we redo that one? Sure. So are we going to see a lot of cameo appearances from characters in the first game, like Samael? I mean, he was kind of a big deal, and he did say some pretty foreboding things. There are, are cameo appearances, but I'm not going to say uh, who or what happens. Because, I mean, with a game like this, it's we story-driven. It's a lot more story-driven than the first game, and so uh, it almost fleshes out Darksiders 1. But um, it's kind of like the one thing we like to keep in our pocket. Because, you know, you, you can understand a game, you know, you, we can talk about the combat and you get a, and you can understand that, but you really don't know it until you experience it. But the story is the one thing that, if I told you, that's it. You know, it's not, you're not going to, experiencing it doesn't change uh, what you know. Well, a lot of, what a lot of people said about Darksiders 1 was that um, maybe in its simplicity, it made them think a lot about a lot of Zelda and mm -hmm. a lot of people likened it to other games. Yeah. But Darksiders 2 seems to move away from that a little bit, having a lot more content, a lot more mechanics, sort of fleshing out the gameplay. Uh, in what ways have you guys maybe cha taken that feedback and helped the game evolve? A lot of what you see, the changes in this game, are stuff we wanted to do with the first game, but just um, ran out of time, didn't have the production uh, capacity to do it. So when we sat down for Dark Siders 2, we're like, let's get all these items and kind of have our um, a fully realized version of what we wanted when we sat down to create Dark Siders the first time around. And so it's a really fleshed out game, but you know, even this game, we're, I've heard people compare it to to other games as they're playing it saying oh now it's more like this game or this reminds me of this and I think that's natural when you have uh, something like Darksiders that as a series is hard to encapsulate because it has a lot of moving parts that we mesh together that um, you know it's not an easy game to describe in a sentence so I think for a way for people to do that is like it's like game X plus game Y and that's an easy thing for people to wrap their heads around but we have a really good feeling that once this game comes out next year or within that time frame people are going to start saying, that game reminds me of Darksiders. And then we'll have come full circle and realize we did it. You know, like we're finally <laughs> our own genre, our own uh, thing. In Darksiders 2, what would you say is your absolute favorite sort of weapon loadout? For me personally, uh, I like to, you know, always a scythe. That's always the main go-to weapon. I prefer to use a heavy weapon, like an axe or a hammer. And then on the skill trees, I usually go with the necromancer track. Uh, where it's kind of stuff like uh, summoning the murders of crows, summoning zombies that explode. Because um, if you really focus on that necromancer track, you don't have to really get into a physical confrontation if you don't want to. You can go full on spellcaster. And maybe it's because I've played it so much and I'm getting lazy or something like that, but I, I like to let my zombies do all the work. <laughs> well, thank you very much for talking to us today, Jay. And uh, Darksiders 2 actually looks really awesome. Seriously, believe me, you want to play this game. Do not miss out. And uh, can you remind our viewers and readers exactly when they can look forward to Darksiders? Yep. Darksiders 2 is coming out for Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, and PC on August 14th. All right, thank you very much.